Thanks for joining me to this latest episode of Ecosystem TV. I'm very excited to be joined or actually hosted by Paul Burton, the general manager of IBM here in APEC. Thanks for having me, Paul. Glad you're here. Glad to do it. Thank you, Paul. Look, we want to talk about um, the year ahead. We want to talk about business. We want to talk about technology. And when we look at the year ahead, there's still a lot of volatility in the market. We're seeing a lot of uncertainty that uh, organizations are um, you know, faced with. But we also have seen over the last couple of years um, a much greater acceptance and willingness to turn to technology to respond to volatility and challenges. You're having obviously a lot of discussion with executives across the region. What are you seeing or how are you um, seeing the year playing out? Well, you know, the, um, when we look at the year, I think I've seen estimates for economic growth anywhere from 2 to 3% uh, for the world. APAC's a little bit different, but not terribly out of that range. But I've seen no estimate for the growth in technology markets that's less than probably four times GDP growth. So if we're looking at GDP growth of 3%, I've seen nothing less than 12% uh, growth for technology markets. Uh, so what that tells me is that companies uh, and governments are willing to invest a tremendous amount of money in technology, and they're doing that for a reason. And I think they're doing that in many ways uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, globalization, despite everything we're hearing, um, is still with us, and it's not going away. It may accelerate, it may decelerate, but it's not going away. And so one of the things that I think globalization is doing uh, worldwide is uh, it's setting standards and it's imposing requirements, especially on developing nations and countries, of which we find several here in, in APAC. So that's number one. Number two, two-thirds of the global economy is probably drives itself from globalization uh, or from digital transformation. Uh, and then finally, there's a major structural uh, change in the system that I think is ongoing. Everyone talks about it. It's real, I can tell you. Uh, I travel throughout the region. Every um, government official I talk to wants to talk about skill shortages and um, shrinking workforces, or you can basically say skill shortages. And so as workforces uh, get smaller because of this, quote, demographic inversion that we're seeing, um, not only are workforces getting smaller, but then the percentage of the workforce that actually has the skills for digital transformation is smaller even yet. All of this results in a skill shortage, which means it's driving up labor rates, which means it's driving up costs, and CEOs understand this and they're, they're thinking about it. So what does all this have to do with technology? Well, anytime you see um, technology markets growing much, much faster than GDP, and you see skill shortages, you see CEOs reaching out to look for technology to solve these problems. Automation, data, AI, these things are king. Uh, obviously, a uh, hybrid cloud platform, which is what we talk about at IBM quite a bit, uh, is very important as well, because it dovetails nicely with the solution to the problem, which is labor shortage. So uh, I expect technology investment to continue to grow. I expect it to far outpace GDP growth. I expect uh, CEOs uh, to continue to invest substantially in technology. One, because they have to to participate in this global economy. And two, um, because they have to to offset wage inflation. In other words, they have to automate to reduce um, the impact of wage inflation. Those are the trends that I see. They're, they're not changing. Uh, they're deepening. They're taking deeper root. Paul, you talked about um, the skill shortage, um, and I want to uh, pick up one topic. I think one uniqueness for the APIC region, specifically the ASEAN region, is the massive influx of Gen Z population. You know, when you look at countries like India, Indonesia, Philippines, there is um, probably 40, 50 percent of the population will be Gen Z. In light of most mature economies shrinking population-wise, what does it mean for the economic opportunities for these countries to, to really become global drivers? Well, um, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, so if you look throughout the 15 or 17 countries, depending on how you count them in APAC, the healthiest countries from a demographic perspective are clear, very clearly uh, India, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And one, they all have large populations. Um, India, obviously, by far the largest, but then Indonesia is 275 million or so people. The Philippines is probably 125 million or so people, but a very, very healthy demographic, and to your point, a lot of uh, young people. So the workforces are expanding in those countries. Uh, if you look at the people that are in the age cohort of 55 and above, 
those cohorts are smaller than the cohorts in their 20s and 20, you know, 20 to 25, which means the working class is still bigger than the people that are retiring. So the workforce is actually increasing. So anytime you see a country with an increasing workforce, obviously that's great for demographic, or pardon me, great for, uh, for economic growth. But then the, the issue squarely becomes, do they have the right skills uh, for the opportunities that are presented to the economy. And increasingly today, those skills are digital skills, they're technology skills, uh, they're STEM skills, uh, they're data and AI skills, so we could go on and on, but you know, in that area. And so one of the things we're doing as an example, which was recently announced and it's in the press, is we opened the uh, Hybrid Cloud and AI Academy in Indonesia. Uh, and our stated objective is to put 100,000 people through that academy as quickly as possible. Now. I know that sounds like a big, bold, audacious goal. It is, um, but we're not shying away from it. We want to put as many people through the Hybrid Cloud and AI Academy as possible to put those skills into the market to support what we see or what the country themselves, in this case Indonesia, sees as the economic opportunity that's in hand. They just need the skills to, to tackle it. So um, countries that are growing demographically or have healthy demographics and are growing population-wise, they will do well going forward completely, almost completely dependent on the skills that they're able to put into the workforce. It's a huge issue, it's a huge issue, and it's one that we're taking seriously, um, very much so, and we're, we're hopefully contributing to part of the solution in Indonesia in particular. You mentioned um, data and AI and specifically automation as well. And um, so all of our research across the region shows that it's top priority for most organizations, um, as you mentioned as well. But I think it's fair to say as well, we're still at the very beginning of the journey and there's a lot more that can be achieved and a lot more value that can be generated. What advice would you give organization on how to tackle data, AI, and automation? Uh, you gotta get the fundamentals right. Um, you've gotta get your foundational skills and your foundational capabilities in the enterprise correct. Everyone wants to jump to a particular solution, uh, a siloed solution in many cases, uh, that claims to use or leverage AI. Um, that's great, it has all the right buzzwords included, but fundamentally, if you're um, running a multinational corporation, as an example, you need certain basic fundamental capabilities. You need a data fabric. You need to make sure that that data fabric supports your cybersecurity strategy or your cybersecurity capabilities. You need AI leveraging all of the data uh, that's made ubiquitously available um, through your data fabric. You need business or enterprise catalogs, you need metadata catalogs, you need all of these things supported by AI. And then only after you have these fundamental capabilities in place can you talk about layering applications on top of it to do all the um, you know, line of business functions and the other things that um, you know, CEOs need to run the business. So I guess the short story is get the foundational capabilities correct, don't skip steps. Uh, most important thing I see. I see too many siloed solutions. I see too many point solutions. Uh, we need to think broadly across the enterprise and make sure that we have uh, fu fundamental or foundational capabilities that are horizontally across the enterprise. If we don't do that, we make mistakes. That's a really good point, and I, I think the you know the data discussion obviously is not a new one. You know, we've already spoken about this when you know when BI was you know one of the hottest topics. So when when we talk to organizations, there's a very high intent on data AI automation, but when you look at the execution, obviously it's lagging a little bit. Do you have any kind of advice on how to get the journey started or how to overcome some of this building block or roadblocks to, to overcome the data issues, maybe some data quality issues, uh, integration across different systems? Um. Well, I, I, again, I think that gets me back to the fundamental, fu fundamental or foundational capabilities. You know, there's so much data out there and data, I think we've all heard the, you know, the, the metrics, was it 2.5 quintillion bytes a day or something that's getting created? Um, I don't even know how many, I think that's 21 zeros, maybe more. I don't know, it's a big number. But, but um, uh, the point is there's so much data being created that humans can't keep up with it. And so if you're gonna have foundational or fundamental capabilities in place in your enterprise to deal with data, what I'm calling a data fabric, then you better have a substantial amount of uh, AI baked into your data fabric to discover um, you know, the metadata and to impose policies, impose may not be the right word, to subject discovered metadata to policies that exist. And so the idea here is, is that um, your architects and your policymakers will go out and figure out that this type of data element should be subjected to this security policy or this access policy. Well, the, the problem then becomes, as all of this new data is being created every day, 
I need AI to discover the data, understand what it's tagged against from a metadata perspective, then automatically apply the existing policy to it to support my security posture going forward. And so if you don't have the data fabric, you don't have the fundamental capabilities in place, you're ultimately going to have um, uh, you're ultimately going to have susceptibilities to cyber and breach and all sorts of bad things. So again, it comes back to get the fundamental capabilities in place around data, around AI, basic automation, especially around IT operations. And once you get those things in place, then you can start to look at line of business applications that leverage the foundation uh, to drive a coherent business response. So uh, that, that's really the key is you got to think holistically. And I think too often, probably because of the way that um, many enterprises budget, too often they're not thinking holistically, they're thinking in terms of a solution, a budget for the solution, and let's just do it and move on. Yeah. But silos don't work well these days. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. And um, I, I just want to maybe leap to the next topic I wanted to talk to you is um, sustainability. And I think to some degree it's, it's related to the data um, discussion as well. Um, sustainability has really matured from a buzzword to a basically a key boardroom topic um, within a very short um, um, amount of time. Um, and it comes up in pretty much all discussions that we are having. Um, what do you think is the role of technology um, to play in the uh, sustainability equation going forward? Well, I think it's huge. Well, first of all, you know, if you, if you want to know how you're doing from a sustainability perspective, you better have a baseline. <laughs> and so you'd be surprised how many businesses out there want to talk about sustainability and their commitment to it and becoming carbon neutral, reducing their carbon footprint. They're saying all these things, but if you ask them what their, their current footprint is today or what their current baseline is today, they don't know. They don't know. And so the number one thing that needs to be done with, with respect to sustainability is give me a baseline. Tell me where I'm at today and then let me snapshot that three, six, 12 months down the road to figure out if I'm improving or getting worse. So that's number one, and that's 100% based on data. And so, again, we could go back to data fabric, but the point is you need to be able to you know, ingest all of the data in your enterprise to understand what's happening from a sustainability perspective, and then you need all the smarts in terms of AI, and you need uh, you know, visibility to the local regulations and each geography so you can make comparisons against yourself, your operations, and what your peers are doing so you can see how you're performing. But the name of the game is you gotta have the baseline, and then once you have the baseline, then you know you know, you can start to take actions to understand how that's going to improve. I think you mentioned um, automation. Automation is huge because if we can automate tasks um, and as a result of that automation consume less resources, then ultimately that feeds all the way back to the beginning of the supply chain and reduces, you know, the carbon footprint. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned obviously it's, it's huge and there's a, it's a big role to play for technology. Do you think sustainability is here to stay? Because I can look back 15 years ago, you know, there was this hype around green IT. But then, you know, after it cost some money and everything, you know, it kind of slowly disappeared again. Do you think sustainability will be, will be here to stay? I think it's here to stay. It, it, that we may change the way we talk about it. Yeah. Uh, but if, if we understand that sustainability means fewer inputs per unit of output, and there will be constant pressure on that to consume less while producing more or the same or more, um, that's not going away. Yeah. I mean, you can think about it. CEOs have always been interested in efficiency and cost reduction. Automation moves them in that direction. Automation also, t you know, requires fewer inputs per unit of output, which is good for, you know, sustainability purposes. So I think we, it, it may morph a little bit how we talk about it, but the, at, at root, it's going to be, the, you know, the same issues year after year. I don't think it's going away. Yeah. I think we'll get better at quantifying it too, and I think we'll get better at making the case for sustainability, um, you know, broadly going forward. So I think it's here to stay. Yeah, and from a quantification point of view, a lot of organizations ha or countries have pledged, you know, their carbon um, goals or carbon neutral goals. So I think obviously nowadays uh, about the quantification of the, the journey um, towards these goals. Uh, I want to pick up one topic you mentioned um, at the beginning about skills and, you know, the, the shortage of talent. Um, when we talk to organizations, there is a challenge that there's a lot of disruption, a lot of transformation thrown at organizations. So how do they filter through all that and how do they resource the, the areas that they really want to tackle? And I think it's fair to say that no one single organization has sussed it out all and has all the solutions for all these different um, drivers. How important is the partner or the technology ecosystem to really look at transformation and innovation on a holistic Framework. I think as uh, particular skills become more and more scarce, 
um, relative to where they are today, you're going to start seeing pockets of them develop and you're going to start seeing, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, an aggregation of skills that does this particular task. And, you know, like attracts like. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so if you've got a bunch of, you know, people that are good at one particular thing, they tend to want to hang out with each other, learn from each other, and advance their skills and evolve together. Uh, that's just, that's, that's what services is all about. So I think you're going to see that pick up, and I think you're going to see companies that are going to need to tap in to these skills, tap into these pockets of skills. So I think the services business uh, consulting, I think, is going to do well going forward. I think you're going to see... Uh, um, there'll continue to be big companies out there that do big projects, but you're going to see a lot of boutique companies popping up that are very niche but are very deep in particular skills. And it's going to put a uh, burden on enterprises to put teams together and form teams dynamically for whatever their particular task is or whatever solution they require. I can tell you at IBM we uh, bring together uh, small partners all the time, make them part of our team. And we go to market that way. We go to market with partners hand in hand. And even though we're a fairly large company, we use a lot of you know, comparatively small partners in order to put the right solution together at the right time for the client. Uh, and so there's a lot that goes into that. So I think the ability to partner seamlessly, uh, to partner dynamically, find the right partner. You know, today we may partner with this company, tomorrow we may compete against them, and that's okay. Um, but um, the important thing is, is that we can bring teams together dynamically at a point in time for a specific solution for a specific client and make it work because the client doesn't want to have more risk because you got five companies coming together and that, that's complex when you think about it. When you think about the relationships, the project management, the solutioning, all the things that need to happen, the scheduling, the cost, it's complex. Making that work in this environment is a competitive advantage. And making it still easy for the for the client to engage, um, yeah. you know, to this partner network yeah. it makes it makes a lot of sense. Um, we're coming slowly to the end, but I wanted to talk about one key topic with you, which is leadership. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, transformation projects or tra transformation journey, in most of the steering committee meetings that I've been part of, technology is actually not the problem. It's about change management. It's about uh, business model management, it's about um, you know, different processes, about cultural change in, in the organization. So um, obviously being a, a very experienced leader yourself, what advice would you give organizations on how to tackle this or what is required from leadership to really drive innovation? I think you got to have a clear understanding of where you want to go, not in terms of a very specific, well-defined, well precise endpoint, but a direction. You need to know directionally where you're going. Directionally, I know that I need ubiquitous access to data. Directionally, I know I need AI baked into everything I do. Directionally, I know I've got to reimagine my core business processes to leverage the technology that I have. So you've, you've got to make broad statements like that. And then every day, you've got to work towards that objective and get closer and closer and closer, understanding that you may never get there, uh, but it's the journey that's important. Because when you think about taking the journey of moving towards ubiquitous data access or a data fabric, uh, moving towards zero trust for cybersecurity, baking AI into everything we do, having you know DevOps up and running and uh, delivering applications you know bit by bit in containers, et cetera, th these are not endpoints. They describe journeys that need to take place. And so we've got to be good travelers. And leaders have to be good at organizing travelers and pointing them in the right direction and modulating them. Um, um, as they go forward. Uh, that's what leadership is going forward. Leadership's no longer about analytically breaking things down and solving po problems and making decisions. It's about steering the ship because the ship is moving. Everything happens so fast today. Um, and change happens, well change is constant, but change happens so fast. And so this idea that we're going to pick a particular endpoint and get there over time, it doesn't work that way. We need to pick a direction and constantly move in that direction. And if it shifts a little bit over time, that's great, but get the team moving. Um, and be comfortable with that. Be comfortable with, um, you know, sometimes a lack of structure and a lack of, um, you know, um, roadsides along the way. Okay, it's um, don't let perfect get in the way of better and still keep moving forward. That's true, that's true. Evolution is key. Evolution is key. That's actually a perfect uh, wrap to the session. Paul, I really appreciate, you know, you taking the time to talk to us for hosting us as well. Thanks, um, you know, for, for listening in. I hope to, you join us soon for the next episode of Ecosystem TV. Thank you very much.